<laughs> Good morning. Uh, Good we morning. are very pleased that you accepted the uh, invitation to speak in the, um, the lecture series Aesthetic Art and Architecture in the, uh, the Caucasus, uh, which is um, uh, also a collaboration with the Chubina uh Center in Tbilisi. Uh, so I'm just happy that you will give your lecture today uh, and uh, called uh, Three Critical Moments in Caucasian uh, Architecture. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased or that we have decided for very short introductions uh, because it would not be uh, easy to do um, justice to what you have achieved over your long career, over decades or four decades uh, of publishing uh, from year to year more and more intensively, uh, making you the, the leading voice in uh, Byzantine, but also in general, um, Eastern, uh, let's say, uh, or Caucasian uh, architecture, the last book has a uh, the title, um, Eastern Medieval Architecture, the Building Traditions uh, of Byzantium uh, and Neighboring Lands, uh, published with Oxford University Press in 2019. Uh, but this is the last, and perhaps not even the last one, because there are others uh, which came out in uh, 2020. Uh, but uh, let me look a moment back to the, the, the first publications and uh, uh, not saying any word about your career with your PhD in uh, the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, in Oregon, in Illinois, and then uh, in Philadelphia for many, many years. But that's only, I mean, not only, that's an ex extremely important part of, of teaching, uh, of training uh, students, of promoting Byzantine studies, uh, Byzantine art and beyond um, uh, in the US and also globally. Uh, but it's also one only one part of what you did because the other part is obviously what I call field work. Uh, and uh, not only field work, but also the intense cooperation with institutions in Istanbul, uh, in many other places uh, on the globe, Moscow and, uh, and others. Uh, in fact, uh, your books have been translated in uh, many languages. One of them is Russian, another one is Turkish, um, uh, etc. It starts with the, uh, the famous book, uh, uh, I most of it came out, uh, the architecture of the Kaliye Jami uh, in Istanbul in 87. And I would say that the, uh, the focus on Byzantine architecture, or let's say architecture of the Caucasian area also, uh, is one focus. The other one from the beginning uh, is about history of photography, history of study, history or historiography um, of Byzantine art from the 19th uh, and 20th century. It has become over the years a focus of equal importance, I would nearly say, uh, your studies on the uh, of architectural history uh, itself. It starts, in fact, uh, this other focus starts, in fact, with a uh, wonderful uh, book, uh, which is called Monuments of uh, Unaging Intellect, Historic Postcards uh, from uh, Byzantine uh, Istanbul. I have to mention the 99 master masterpiece, um, um, standard book, Master Builders uh, of Byzantium, which also came out in uh, years later, as a paperback revised version. Uh, I want to mention, I jump over all the other books you published over the years. I just want to uh, say, uh, want to mention the, uh, the the study on Palmyra 1885, another book on the um, on the history of photography, the Wolf Expedition, uh, and the photographs of John Henry uh, Haynes. Uh, and I have also. Uh, in mind uh, the the book you did um, uh, with um, the, the the great exhibition you did on Osman Hamdi Bay uh, and, and the Americans ideology diplomacy uh, art exhibition catalog done in uh, 2011 together with Renata Holland also based on partly if I remember correctly on the archives uh, which are held in your uh, in your university I was in the there when you. Uh, open the exhibitions of it. it was a very strong, strong moment. And uh, I think there's a lot to be done uh, in this direction. Uh, also in the future, uh, the last uh, book I mentioned already, I just want to add another one uh, relating your work in the Byzantine provinces. Uh, that means, uh, uh, and adjacent areas, a better spoken visualizing community, uh, art, material, culture, and settlement uh, in Byzantine. Uh, Cappadocia, the title already gives some hint to the, uh, the richness of approaches uh, uh, of the notion of architecture uh, in the work of 
uh, Robert Osterhout, which goes not just in the sense of what he also did, obviously, uh, the cupola to say, uh, but, uh, but also really in the uh, social, historical, uh, and material culture dimension, uh, the materiality of architecture, uh, so to speak, uh, which is uh, so rich and so important that uh, I just refrain uh, from, say, uh, any other work uh, about uh, your uh, work. So please, uh, Rob, I'm very happy that you are with us and we are looking forward to your lecture uh, on the three moments <laughs> on commercial architecture. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, please uh, don't register the lecture now. It will be recorded uh, officially by the KHI uh, and uh, then made accessible. Uh, so please. Uh, thank you, Gerhard, for that <coughs> brief introduction. <laughs> um, it's great to see everyone here and uh, to see um, so many old friends uh, in the audience. I wish we could be together in Florence or on an airplane somewhere or Istanbul or Tbilisi or uh, in Armenia. Um, and I've learned so much from so many people in this audience, particularly my traveling companions, um, uh, whose eyes really helped me to understand the architecture that we're um, looking at. Um, and I should point out that the Wolf expedition that I write about has nothing to do with Gerhard Wolf. <laughs> Uh, it's a completely different wolf, but anyway. Um, today I shall look at three important periods in the development of Georgian and Armenian architecture, uh, focusing on what I perceive to be monuments of creativity and innovation in design. Okay, here we are. Um, for each moment, I'll highlight a specific monument while attempting to situate it within a broader perspective. A bunch of what I say will derive from my 2019 book, Eastern Medieval Architecture, but I should add um, that I am neither Georgian nor Armenian, and I'm really a non-specialist here amid an intimidating crowd of specialists. So my remarks today are really aimed primarily at my fellow non-specialists in today's audience. So those of you who are specialists will know everything I have to say, bear with me. Let me begin with a look at the seventh century for which I'll focus on the Church of the Holy Cross in Jvari, which rises prominently on a hill above the medieval Georgian city of Mishketa. Um, some background is in order. We're talking about a period in which the Byzantine Empire was descending into the Dark Ages. Nevertheless, although faced with um, similar potential difficulties, there's hardly a Dark Ages in the Caucasus, at least during the seventh century. A frontier zone between warring Byzantines and Persians and subsequently Byzantines and Arabs, the architecture of the region is distinctive both for its quality and its abundance. The remarkable flourishing of architecture in the Caucasus is unparalleled in contemporary Byzantium with finely constructed stone buildings um, and the introduction of a variety of new and innovative building forms. But those structural systems differ in the details. The dome emerges as a central design feature in uh, Caucasian church architecture as it had in Byzantium. Um, several vaulted basilicas in both Armenia and Georgia incorporated fully developed cross stone units and spatial organization similar to those in Byzantium proper. Um, while there is a heightened awareness of events outside the region, what is most distinctive in the Caucasus is the coalescing of local architectural forms. There were, of course, some opportunities for the transmission of architectural ideas as uh, Caucasian elites visited Constantinople or imperial military campaigns uh, uh, took place in the region. But it may, may be best to view the architectural production of the seventh century Caucasus as a parallel development to what we know from elsewhere in Byzantium. And while their architectural forms are remarkably similar, 
Armenia and Georgia were distinctive both linguistically and ecclesiastically. Armenian is an Indo-European language, somewhat similar to Persian, while Georgian is unique, unrelated to any other linguistic group. Each has its own alphabet. Armenia is said to be the first state to adopt uh, Christianity, the date 303 often given, although as Miaphysite. Um, it maintains its own ecclesiastical hierarchy and patriarch. In contrast, Georgia remained Halcedonian, recognizing the religious authority of Constantinople. Nevertheless, the borders between Armenia and Georgia were fluid and permeable, and the architectural developments are best discussed together. Now, that said, it's no easy task in light of the history and historiography of the region. Modern political boundaries do not reflect historical ones with scholarship often nationally focused um, while the standing monuments are spread across several modern states with less than friendly borders. Indeed, it may be impossible to draw a historic map of the medieval Caucasus on which all current stakeholders would agree. The historic nucleus of both Armenia and Georgia extends into what is now Eastern Turkey, and it once included areas now within Azerbaijan or under Russian control. In addition to uh, the Armenian and Georgian languages, much of the scholarship on the architecture has been in Russian, a linguistic triple whammy able to put off all but the most stalwart of Western scholars. Nevertheless, the remarkable inventiveness of the Caucasian builders deserves special attention with new elements introduced into plans, vaulting, and surface articulation. Roman heritage may be a critical component to understanding the architecture of the region. While few Roman monuments survive in the region today, the restored temple at Garni is a notable exception, uh, a strong Roman presence is documented. For most of our examples, the wall construction is of finely cut ashlar facing on a mortared rubble core following the Roman model and distinct from the pure ashlar construction of Syria with which it is often compared. Uh, early churches often retained distinctive temple-like features. Uh, the fifth century basilica at Eroroik, for example, rises above a step base, originally with lateral porticos. When fully standing from a distance, its profile might have been confused with that of a temple. Barrel vaults and banded barrel vaults also follow the Roman tradition, as at the fifth century Sioni Basilica at Bolnisa, Bolnisi in Georgia, or the Kazakh Basilica at Abaran in Armenia. And there are a variety of other examples. Cruciform or compound piers in all reflect the structural system. Domes usually rise above uh, squinches in the transitional zone. However, um, I'm following Persian uh, examples, um, although pendentives appear occasionally, more commonly in Armenia than Georgia, at least in the early churches. In striking contrast to contemporary Byzantine churches, the Caucasian monuments are exceptionally well documented with public inscriptions on their exterior. Cross stone basilica may be the best term to categorize many of the Caucasian churches. In Georgia, the church of the Ascension at Sromi, uh, built uh, circa 626 to 35, has a cross stone unit at its core, the dome braced by barrel vaults on four sides. Um, the dome now reconstructed rose above four compound piers with trumpet squinches in the transition. The nave is close to square uh, with little decoration on the facades. The plan includes a narthex with flanking chambers and probably lateral arcades as well. Within the interior, a gallery extends above the narthex and western corner bays. On the east facade, the planar surface is broken by two tall V-shaped recesses that flank the apse, distinctive features that we find in both Armenian and Georgian churches. Within the Armenian sphere, the cathedral at Moren, uh, completed before uh, circa 640, 
is remarkable for its scale and tall proportions. Its centrally positioned dome rises above four compound piers and is braced by barrel vaults on four sides. As is common in Armenia, there is no narthex with portals on the west, north, and south facades. The sanctuary is flanked by lateral chapels. The dome rises above trumpet squinches and a tall drum emphasizing the height of the interior. But the architecture is austere with planar surface, surfaces and prismatic volumes. The Church of St. Gayane at Vagarshapat is similar, although smaller, commemorating the martyrdom of an early Armenian saint and companion to the more famous Ripsime, the church was constructed around 630. In contrast, the large church at Aruch, dated uh, to the 660s, maintains an elongated basilican character with a dome at its center, supported above pendentives and piers engaged to the lateral walls with a remarkably unified and monumental interior. The large church at Talan must be rough, roughly similar in date with an elongated interior and the dome rising above pendentives, but it is considerably more complex in form and detailing with lateral aisles flanking the nave. In addition to the Eastern apse being expressed on the exterior, the cross arms also terminate in apses, a type of plan we see in later Georgian churches. These, as well as the dome drum, are faceted on the exterior and articulated by arcades with engaged coupled columns. Now the contrast between the stark simplicity of Mren or Zromi and the uh, elaborations evident at Talon indicate the variety possible in the seventh century Caucasus. Uh, let me now turn to the Church of the Holy Cross at Shvari, which may be dated uh, uh, circa 586 to 604 and introduces a remarkably different architectural design. Uh, the development of the domed octagon church type may have its first appearance here, a remarkably innovative uh, design that proved popular across the Caucasus and beyond. The centralized nave is extended by apses on four sides with small niches at the corners opening into subsidiary spaces. Squinches at the corners support an octagon drum with sets of smaller squinches transitioning to a hemispherical dome. Small windows appear in four facets of the drum, which appears as a tall octagon on the exterior. Um, the four apses project on the exterior, joined to other compartments by blind arcades, with figural sculpture enlivening many surfaces. But there is an experimental quality to the building, with details um, not fully uh, not fully resolved. For example, the squinches spring from the haunches of the arches and do not relate visually or structurally to the eight piers below them. And there is no cornice to mark the transition to dome. Built on the site where uh, traditionally St. Nino, the apostle of Georgia, is credited with the conversion of King uh, Miriam III of Iberia to Christianity by erecting a huge miraculous cross on the site of a pagan temple. Inscriptions mention the builders and their titles. Um, Stephanos I, Prince of Iberia, with the title Patricios, along with Demetrius and Adernaze, both titled Ipatos. One wonders if the unusual design of the church could reflect current events, as Stephanos reversed the policies of his father and sided with the Persians against the Byzantines, even briefly turning away from Chalcedonian or, uh, Christianity. The return to orthodoxy in 608 resulted in the rupture between the Armenian and George churches and the Byzantine army uh, under Heraclius emerged victorious here and Heraclius had Stephanos flayed alive in 627 uh, with the Georgian church remaining in the orthodox fold. Now, whatever the possible political implication, the new forms seen at Jabari found rapid popularity across both Georgia and Armenia. The Sioni Church at uh, Atani in Georgia is quite similar to Jabari, although probably slightly later in date. The Church of St. Ripsime at Agarshapad in Armenia 
dated uh, 618 to 30, is similar in many ways, although characteristic of the Armenian churches, less sculptural on the exterior, which is brought out to square. The positions of the apses is marked by V-shaped indentations with a gable rising above the midsection of east, uh, each facade. The four facades are virtually identical, differentiated only by the addition of a late medieval belfry on the west side. Uh, the dome rises uh, um, as a political drama with a conical cap. The interior regularizes many of the awkward features of Jari. Squinches rise directly from the piers, and the transition to drum is marked by a cornice. The drum is pierced by 12 windows organized in sets of three. And the introduce of the dome is articulated by roundels and a radiating cross composed of 12 rays aligned with the windows. So how do we account for the innovative plan of Shvari and related buildings? First, although there may be Persian precedents for the use of squinches to transition to the dome, um, there are no good examples of the centralized plan. Those in Persian architecture tend to be square or cruciform. Second, one may ask, is there a special meaning associated with the centralized plan? The idea of the centralized martyrium is often noted by scholars, as many of the churches in this group were commemorative, honoring the sacred locations or figures critical to early Caucasian Christianity. At the same time, however, many contemporary commemorative structures were basilican in design, so many in fact, um, that it is difficult to make a distinction based solely on function. Why, for example, was Ripsime honored with a centrally planned church? Why her, compa well, her companion martyr, Guyane, was commemorated at about the same time with a basilica? In the final analysis, the choice of architectural design may have been as much a formal decision as anything else. That is, evidence of the creativity and love of variety that characterizes the Caucasian building tradition throughout its rich history. Now, this inventiveness and love of variety is in evidence in later centuries as well notably in the dramatic architectural revival of the 10th and 11th centuries. Um, for this period, I'll focus on the Georgian church of uh, St. John the Baptist at Oshbank, um, the grandest of the 10th century churches built by David the Great and his brother Bagrat. Uh, the Dome Basilica follows a plan seen in the seventh century at Tallinn, um, although much elaborated and the remarkable variety in its decorative details and vaulting forms is virtually unprecedented. After uh, a period of minimal architectural activity, both Armenia and Georgia experienced a flourishing of construction in the 10th and 11th centuries, notably churches with finely carved ashlar construction and sculptural ornamentation, distinct from their contemporary Byzantine counterparts. Indeed, much seems to follow directly upon the regional construction techniques and building types established in the seventh century. Almost as if the intervening three centuries did, did not exist. The elegance of the architecture of the 10th and 11th century reveals little of the complex political situation in the Caucasus. The entire area was under Arab domination during much of the transitional period, but by the ninth century, both Armenia and Georgia had become increasingly independent. Both were ruled as uh, Arab protectorates by members of the Armenian Bagratid family, initially as princes, but by the 880s as kings. And the elevation in their titles corresponds with the weakening of Arab control in the region which allowed both Georgians and Armenians to become relatively powerful and prosperous in the 10th century. But the region remained a series of small, semi-independent and often feuding Christian polities set between the expanding power of Byzantium to the west and the emerging threat of the Seljuks to the east with borders and political alliances remaining fluid. 
the church architecture of Armenia and Georgia remains, uh, remain, uh, remained remarkably similar through the early period, indicative of the close religious ties of the area during that time. Both the architectural developments and religious ties of the 10th century and later are more distinct, uh, reflecting the remarkable individuality of parallel cultures. Although construction techniques and decorative features are often similar, the Georgians preferred uh, the basilica, whether domed or not, uh, to the more centralized designs of the Armenians, as evident at Akhtamar, or the Armenian capital of Ani. Architecture flourished from the mid-10th century onward, beginning in the western Georgian regions of the Tau Klarjeti, associated with the rule of David III of Tau. Churches were often isolated in the rugged landscape, doubling as monasteries, cathedrals, burial places, and administrative centers. More than anything, however, they stand as monuments to their patrons, for in a land with shifting alliances and frontiers, churches prove to be the most durable monuments as their survival testifies. Let me begin with Octe Ecclesia. Um, a grand three aisle basilica, reviving a type known in the early period. Built at the time of David the Great, it is the church of the four holy men as opposed to four churches as the name might suggest. A splendid monastery is mentioned in a text of 965. The church may have been built shortly before that date. Um, in the apse, an unnamed female appears holding a model of the church. While lacking a dome, Octe Ecclesia is nevertheless impressive in its austere monumentality and magnificent pristine setting. As with the Armenian churches just discussed, the construction is of ashlar on a rubble core uh, with a superstructure resting on a stepped base. The church itself is three aisled um, with the nave and side aisles covered by banded barrel vaults, the lofty central nave rising to include thin clear story windows in addition to two zones of smaller windows in the side aisles. The exterior is articulated by blind arcades which step up gracefully on the east and west facades with an emphasis on linearity and vertical attenuation. The Romanesque-like orderliness suggested by the architectonic detailing is, however, misleading. The bays of the nave are of different dimensions. Um, the arcading of the exterior walls bears no relation to the internal structural system. Even the banding of the barrel bolts doesn't always match from the nave to the side aisles. As in other Caucasian examples of the period, architectonic features are used as an aesthetic solution rather than as a visual expression of structure. Joints visible in the um, ashlar on the upper east and uh, east and west facades indicate a change in the design either during construction or very shortly thereafter. The original nave roof had a shallower pitch and was about four meters lower. That is following the angle of the stepped arcades, probably without a clear story. An inscription on the apex of the Eastern Gable names David as Coro Palatis, a title he received in 978, and thus modifications of the building must have occurred after that time. Octa Ecclesia is unusual in its vaulting, although the nearby monastic church of Parhali is similarly barrel vaulted, and it includes all of the design features of Octa Ecclesia in a single phase of construction. It is unclear if Parhali might, be, might have influenced the increased elevation of the nave at Okta Ecclesia or vice versa. Considerably more common for Georgian architecture, however, is the domed basilica. And of these, the Church of St. John the Baptist at Oshvank is the grandest of the 10th century churches built by David the Great and his brother Bagrat. The site served both as a monastery and administrative center, although virtually nothing of the secular buildings survives, and the monastery buildings are in ruins. Lavishly decorated with exterior sculpture, 
images of the founders appeared presenting the church at the southeast corner and the uh, exterior preserves abundant inscriptions, both carved and painted. The plan of the church is equally complex, measuring uh, 40.6 by 27 meters internally, with a dome rising about 30 meters off the floor. The cross arms of the dome basilica terminate in apses. And all three apses are framed by chapels, those to the east apparently pastophoria. The single aisle nave was covered by a banded barrel vault, now mostly fallen, composed of five bays of different lengths marked by step pilasters along the walls. The dome with an interior diameter close to nine meters rises on a tall drum uh, broken by 12 large windows. Above four piers that divine, define the crossing. Those to the east are cylindrical, those to the west compound equipped with carved niches. The high arches are slightly pointed with pendentives in the transition, um, decorated with shell-like insects. In addition to the rich architectural sculpture, traces of painted decoration survive throughout the interior, as well as decoration in red paint on the exterior. The south porch, with its oddly symmetrical, ga asymmetrical gabled roof, encloses a lengthy inscription in red paint that provides a wealth of details about the uh, founders presented in the words of the master mason, Griegel. It tells not just uh, about the founders, but enumerates the workers and materials involved in the project. For the architectural historian, this is a precious document. But the painted decoration of the exterior raises a few questions in my mind. Was this inscription intended to be carved? Elsewhere on the porch, colonnettes appear unfinished with the carved pattern continued in red paint. In other places, however, the red paint is clearly an afterthought separate from the construction or carving as on the uh, east window, um, topped by an arch constructed of horizontal courses onto which radial voussoirs have been painted in red. The south nave opens into a portico, a marvel of unusual vaulting forms and an explosion of carved decoration, perhaps the best surviving example of the innovative approach of the masons coupled with a love of decorative variety. Each of the piers is unique, cylindrical, quatrefoil, octagonal, fluted, spiral. The vaults are similarly innovative, each unique and lavishly carved, octagonal above squinches with a central cross framed by scalloped segments. The final octagonal column is uniquely decorated with angels, holy figures, and the shaft is covered by a pattern that resembles angels' wings. External decoration is similarly robust. Both figural and decorative sculpture is often asymmetrically disposed. Now built more than a century, a generation later, uh, the cathedral at Ishkane uh, uh, was inaugurated in its present form in 1038. And it's similarly uh, a monumental dome basilica of fine ashlar construction resplendent with relief sculpture. The masons here similarly delighting in variety. The walls are heavily articulated with multiple setbacks detailed with pilasters and colonnettes that continue into the arcades. The exuberant linearity of the architectural detailing is complemented by a rich painted program partially preserved with the exaltation of the cross dramatically uh, set above a background of lapis lazuli in the dome. But the exuberant architectonic detailing bears only a superficial, bears only a nominal relationship to the internal structural divisions and oddly the lateral facades and the dome are not aligned. The external arcading, even the window placement, 
uh, does not reflect the internal structure. As with the slightly earlier um, Georgian churches, the decorative uh, facade seems to have been the primary concern of the Masons, not any sort of structural logic for the, uh, uh, for the arcading. Now for the 13th century, let me turn my attention to the development of the Gavit or Zamatun in Armenia with a look at the monastery at Gegard. Um, the Gavit was a multi-purpose space that could be used as a meeting hall, burial place, overflow from the church, or even the setting for services when the main church was not used. While the uh, exterior of the Gavit remained relatively plain, the interior often displays a bravura array of vaulting forms. In all examples, variety seems to be the key concern with forms such as the Mukarnas vault that reflect the close interaction with the Seljuks of the period. Um, and just to confuse you historically, I show you my favorite incomprehensible map for the 13th century. Now, unlike Armenia, which uh, experienced a revival in the 13th century with innovative new architectural forms, within Georgian territory, standardization seems to have been the rule, although with an increasing uh, verticality to forms. Um, 13th century Armenia saw a great deal of construction, although the church proper remained relatively conservative, usually domed and cruciform, with corner compartments on two levels, the dome rising above pendentives with the surfaces of the vaults unarticulated. Um, the exteriors are similarly formulaic. Within monastic complexes, however, many were now surrounded by clusters of subsidiary buildings, loosely organized and distinct, the whole often fortified, as in the monastery of Hadpat in the uh, mountainous north, or as Gegard in a gorge near Garni. All grew around older foundations. Gegard is primarily from the 13th century uh, on the site of an older cave hermitage and, hermitage and spring expanded uh, with both rock cut and masonry architecture. Some of the additions were small chapels, um, the result of private benefaction. Um, but uh, in all of these monasteries, there are also a variety of other building types, belfries, refectories, uh, libraries, and so on. The most impressive and original of the 13th century additions is the monumental entry vestibule, usually set on the western side of the church and called either a gavit or zamatun. Although they originate earlier, they proliferate in the 13th century. Um, Horamos is usually cited as one of the earliest examples. Um, most commonly, they were nine bayed with a central vault opening into an oculus with a bravura display of vaulting forms. In all, variety seems to be the key concern with several different vaulting types employed simultaneously or alternating with panels of a uh, stone ceiling. Sometimes the 13th century examples include mukarnas or other forms derived from contemporaneous Seljuk architecture and reflect the close working relations of the Masons with their Muslim counterparts. The Gavid at Gegard added before 1225, shortly after the completion of the main church in 1215, is particularly impressive with perhaps twice the floor space as the church proper. The vaults rise above four cylindrical piers with a central bay covered by a cascade of Mukarnas with an oculus at the crown. Although 13th century, throughout 13th century Armenia, the Gavit contrasts dramatically with the austerity of the Catholicon. For most Gavits, the exterior surface remains relatively plain with carved doors and window frames and sparsely applied relief sculpture. At uh, Harjavank Monastery, the vaulting is uh, lavish with a central Mukarnas vault, while the exterior was left plain. 
uh, at Hagpat Monastery, um, the um, um, and Gavit expanded around uh, 1209, um, has vaults delineated by intersecting arches. Within the cupola, a second set of intersecting arches rises to the oculus. The Gavit at the Church of the Holy, Holy Cross in Ani, before, uh, built before 1225, is similarly innovative. Elongated and attached to the south side of the church, the central Mukarnas vault is set on the diagonal, raised above two pairs of intersecting arches. Um, the other areas of the ceiling are filled with geometric patterning into colors of stone. At the ruined church of Aspansenkol in Armenia, um, um, a 13th century architectural drawing was found thinly etched on the exterior wall surface of the Gavit that seems to have been a scaled preparatory drawing for the construction of the Mukharnas vault, indicating that details of the elevation were determined during the construction process. This is, in fact, our earliest diagram of a Mukharnas vault, um, and with the standardized masonry construction in the Caucasus, provided all the information the masons required to construct the vault. Now, innovative vaulting forms appear in other types of monastic buildings as well, such as libraries and refectories. The refectory at Hagarsin uh, employs a similarly innovative system of vaulting repeated twice to span the elongated interior. What is fascinating here is the interchangeability of forms, both within different building types and across confessional boundaries. Well, um, to conclude, where should we situate the remarkable flourishing and originality in the architecture of the Caucasus? Earlier generations of scholars may have sought to view the Caucasus as the origin of Romanesque or Gothic architecture in Western Europe. And indeed, vaulting forms and architectonic articulation are often comparable. Similar attempts um, have been made to mark the origin of the cross dome church in the Caucasus rather than in Byzantium. Both claims, I believe, are misdirected and diminish our appreciation of the Caucasian achievements. As medieval studies now champions a global approach, it may be best to view the developments in Western Europe, Spain, Italy, Byzantium, the Caucasus, Russia and the Balkans, as well as medieval uh, Islam, as representing parallel achievements of societies at similar points in development but often with distinctive and different concerns coming to the fore. Similarities among buildings widely separated by time and space often might be best attributed to the deep-seated traditions of the Roman past. But as we look at medieval architecture in a global perspective, the differences may be as important as the similarities. A second point is that architectural production is local and reflects locally known practices, materials, and concerns. In most instances, masons did not travel, and it goes without saying that buildings didn't either. Technologies require human beings as vehicles of transmission. The presence of the Armenian architect Turdat in Constantinople in the late 10th century may be a curious exception to the rule but for the technical knowledge he brought to the reconstruction of the Dome of Hagia Sophia, uh, we remain grateful. Now, with the movement of populations and shifting demographics, there is ample evidence of cross-fertilization. Um, for example, the forest or encouraged movement of ethnic populations in the Byzantine period um, may be impossible to document, Although we know, for example, there were both Armenians and Georgians in Cappadocia by the 10th century. And the evidence is often provocative, but inconclusive. Alas, there are no inscriptions in either language, only in Greek, but some details are tantalizing. For example, the 10th century church and the elite residence at Selime, the dedicatory panel is remarkably reminiscent of the Oshvank panel. 
and the interior of the church at um, um, Sally May even includes an enigmatic uh, niche like those at Oshmank. So could this have been a Georgian residence? I will simply leave that an open question. Well, let me end with um, a few um, remarks here. Um, the centralized plan we first saw at Shvari is not only repeated in the seventh century, but in a variety of later examples in the Caucasus, notably at Akhtamar, but it also finds its way to Constantinople, as for example, in the 11th century church of the Kamariotisa on Halki. How the design came to the Byzantine capital is a matter of debate, but it's important to note that the brick construction and decoration of the Kamariotisa are purely Constantinopolitan. That is to say, it was built by local masons. Similarly, the domed octagon churches of Greece include many familiar features uh, for which a Caucasian origin is often cited, but in all examples, the construction is local, the details Byzantine, and the differences and distance from the Caucasus is noteworthy. Now, my point is that an architectural idea has traveled, but probably the Masons have not. Now, the situation may be somewhat different when we turn to the innovative vaulting forms we first saw at Oshvang, which continue into later construction. For example, it's hard to make sense out of the Danish Menden uh, Divri Mosque and Hospital without a mobile and heterogeneous workforce in the 13th century. Indeed, at least one Georgian artisan is mentioned in documents um, at the site of Divri. Similarly, um, scholars have noted workers from the Caucasus at numerous Seljuk caravanserais, and the rapid development of architecture under the Seljuks and Beyliks in the 13th century is hard to imagine without the input of Caucasian masons. Finally, the appearance of the Mokarnas vault in the Armenian Gavits and other monastic buildings emphasizes the interchangeability of architectural forms across confessional boundaries and across functional typologies. It doesn't mean, of course, that the Armenians invented the Mokarnas vault, simply that borders, national, religious, cultural, and ideological, were fluid and permeable, particularly in the 13th century. And this for me is the challenge of the architecture of Armenian Georgia from the perspective of the global turn in medieval studies. On the one hand, it offers an important corrective to the Byzantine-centered or Western medieval-centered studies, which emphasize uh, uh, emphasizing both the similarities and differences of cultures in parallel perhaps with only minimal interchange at times. On the other hand, there are remarkable periods of connectivity. Could we understand the uh, achievements of either 13th century Anatolia or the Caucasus without the movement of workers and technologies? So this is the challenge to determine when we are looking at societies developing separately and yet in parallel, perhaps reliant on a common past. Alternatively, um, when are visual similarities simply the result of stylistic interchange, that is basic looking and copying? And when is it a matter of technological transfer, relying on human uh, transmission of technical knowledge? A careful look at the uh, architecture of the Caucasus offers us all three possibilities. That is, a textbook case for how to appreciate the regional within a global medieval perspective. Thank you. <laughs>